Let's start now. Okay, uh, good afternoon and uh, we welcome you to this uh, session number six of the uh, ANBIG webinar series. Uh, this session will uh, detail the narrowband imaging diagnosis of duodenal neoplasia. So we have here today uh, two, two uh, great speakers and endoscopists. Uh, one is uh, Professor Rajvinder Singh from Lyle McEwen Hospital in uh, Adelaide, Australia, and our friend from uh, King Chulalongkorn Memorial Hospital at, uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, Dr. Rapat Pitayanan. I'm uh, Dr. John Erdko from the Philippines, and uh, I think uh, we're our first speaker would be Professor Raj Singh. Uh, Raj? Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. I think it's uh, Rapat who goes goes first with the uh, imaging. Okay. And then, and then we'll follow with therapeutics. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Rapat, Rapat. Yeah, yeah, you go first. Okay. Okay, I would like to share my screen now. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So, hi everyone. Um, today, uh, I would like to talk about um, how to diagnose the duodenal neoplasia. Um, today, uh, we will focus on the non ampullary polyps. And uh, we have to know that the different um, disease, the underlying disease, uh, will be impact to the uh, diagnosis of the duodenal polyps. Um, firstly, uh, if we know that this patient has the sporadic, um, uh, no underlying disease is a sporadic case, it may be different uh, from the hereditary disease. And the majority of the hereditary disease will be FAB, which is the APC gene mutation. And the other one is the MUTYH associated polyposis, which we can find really um, not much in, in our practice. So I will skip uh, this disease. And finally, we will talk about how to diagnose uh, the duodenal polyp in this patient. I will start with the fat patient first. Um, you have to know that the prevalence of the duodenal polyps in fat patients in Asian's population was around uh, 20 to 60 percent, but in Caucasian, it was uh, more uh, a lot than the Asian's population with up to more than uh, 70 percent. And the uh, duodenal cancer in those population population was in Asian it was um, around one percent, but in Caucasians, the prevalence was higher, uh, up to 80. 18%. And this is the uh, well-known classification of the duodenal polyps in fat patient uh, called modified Spitzerman classification. I think everyone know uh, this um, classification uh, already, but I would like to emphasize that they would like um, this classification focus on the number of polyps, polyp size, histology and the percent of the dysplasia. If your patient had more than 20 um, polyps or more than one centimeter of diameter or villus or high clade dysplasia, uh, they will gain three points in each. Um, the important stage in the modified Spitzerman classification was class stage three and four. Uh, which means that if the, your patient has a score more than seven, it will be uh, the impact for the follow-up schedule. Because the risk of the cancer develop around 7% uh, in the stage three and up to 40% uh, in stage four. There was a question that any other modality that um, 
can help you to surveillance uh, the uh, polyps, the renal polyps in uh, fat patient. There was a published publication two years ago about the chromoendoscopy for surveillance those patients, but um, they just found that the conclusion of this study was um, chromoendoscopy can improve the number of durino adenoma, but not the size of the adenoma. And even they can improve the um, splinter man state uh, between pre-standing and post-standing, but the improvement was from only the number of the adenoma, but not other factors. So um, from this study, we can um, um, conclude that the chromoendoscopy may not help for surveillance in those, pa those patients. So um, our team in Thailand uh, did the um, study about the dual focus NBI and confocal laser endomicroscopy in patients with FAF for surveillance duodenal adenoma. This is the cross-sectional study um, in 27 patients with um, around 60 images. We find that um, the pine cone or leaf chef the lie at duodenal polyp can represent the uh, duodenal adenoma. For the confocal findings, uh, we can find the normal epithelium border on the uh, blue arrow with regular capillary pattern on the uh, red arrow here. For adenoma, it was different. It becomes darker, a regular epithelium on the blue arrow and uh, with the tortuous capillary network on the red arrows here. Um, a part of the um, pine cone um, appearance, we found the bumpy lesions or nodular protrusion in Japan, uh, which um, mentioned in the Japanese um, article. This is this is another um, finding for the duodenal uh, ampulla, duodenal adenoma as well. Which, if you um, put the scope closer, you can you cannot find any. Uh, white opaque substance or pine cone appearance here, but um, this also can represent the duodenal adenoma. From those findings, we found that um, we, we apply those findings at ampulla and non ampullary polyps in fat patient, and we found that the NPV, uh, which is um, uh, very high in both uh, ampulla and non ampullary polyps even using NBI or uh, PCLE. Um, as you know that the uh, NPV more than 90% can be used as the screening tool for um, surveillance uh, in, um, in any patients, in any diseases. Um, so um, from this study, you can see that um, most of the NPV in uh, both um, NBI and PCLE modality can provide up to uh, more than 90% except uh, the PCLE in non ampullary poly. Moreover, the staging for the real-time diagnosis uh, in those patients was 100% um, accuracy uh, when compared to the pathology. But unfortunately, um, our study uh, didn't find any Spitzerman state four, so we can adopt this data to um, the patient with uh, Spitzerman state four. Moreover, not all we lie is equal to the adenoma. If you can see here, this is the partial um, staining of a white opaque substance or white we lie in the uh, blue circle, which the pathology come with the um, just duodenitis, not adenoma. So if you want to um, diagnose by the real-time NBI, you should diagnose adenoma in uh, the lesion with more than 50% of the uh, white opaque substance at the lesions. For the non-FAB patient or sporadic cases, there was a prevalence of um, this disease in um, Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology last year. This 
This is the retrospective study in Japan for 12 years in uh, 400 cases from 11 centers in, in Japan. They found that um, majority of those patients was durinal adenoma and only 20% um, come with the invasive carcinoma. And the factor that can predict the undifferentiated or invasive type of the adenoma of the um, cancer uh, was the oral site of the ampulla. There was another interesting study in Australia about um, the prevalence of the uh, durinal adenoma uh, in patients who was diagnosed with sporadic uh, durinal adenoma. They want to know that any other um, small bowel polyps um, in, pa in those patients. They use the video capsule endoscopy in 100 control patients who come with the iron deficiency anemia or any indication uh, for um, mid gut bleeding and 100 durinal uh, adenoma cases. They found that no small bowel polyps in either group, but interestingly, the patient who had the um, uh, sporadic adenoma Duodenal adenoma has higher uh, overall colonic polyps and advanced colonic adenoma compared to the control group. So um, recently, there was a study in Japan to, um, to, to find the criteria to differentiate the duodenal lesions uh, between adenoma, uh, neoplasia, and non-neoplasia. This was the retrospective study in Japan in non-FAB patients. And they found that two types of the epithelium, as you can see here on the, left, on the left side, we call this one as a group type epithelium. And on the right side, uh, they call uh, the pit pattern, pit type uh, epithelium. If you use the magnified endoscopy, in those uh, in both lesions, you can see for the group type, uh, you can see the subepithelial capillary in the um, brownish vessel here, and you can see the interventing part or interventing uh, space uh, as a in the arrow here. But for the pit type, you will see the uh, the clip opening. Uh, as the white line here. So they found that the pit type, if you can see like this, we call this is a pit type. And moreover, they can, um, if you see the pit type, you have to look for the demarcation line as well. If you can see this, they, they, they say that the pit type surface pattern or irregular subepithelial capillary uh, can represent the low grade or high grade or even cancer in those patients. They validate this criteria in 114 dunial lesions. And they found that the, this criteria provide um, very good validity score, especially at the lesion uh, of the D1 to D2 and D2 uh, area but it's not good for the, uh, the first part of the duodenum. You can see here the number of the same spec PPV, NPV, and accuracy was more than 90%. So they propose the, this diagram. If you can find the duodenal lesions by white light endoscopy and suspected for the non-ampullary duodenal uh, neoplasia, if the lesion was located at the bowel, you have to biopsy because it may be difficult to apply any criteria for diagnosed neoplasia or non-neoplasia. But if the lesion located at the descending or horizontal part of the duodenum, you have to use the magnified NBI to look at the surface of the lesion. It, if it appear as blue like this, uh, you have to biopsy because um, they may be neoplasia or non-neoplasia, but mostly, mostly non-neoplasia with 
you do not do any endoscopic resection. But if you can find the pit uh, pattern or a pit um, type of the epithelium, you no need to do any biopsy because you the most likely diagnosis of this lesion would be neoplasia that you need to resect by endoscopy. If you take a biopsy, it may be difficult for um, uh, uh, endoscopic resection. Or if you cannot find any um, epithelial pattern and you can see the vascular pattern with the magnified NDI. If it's regular, you have to biopsy. But if it's irregular, it can be neoplasia that you need to resect as well. So no need to biopsy. Go on for resection. Um, that was the criteria for differentiate neoplasia or neoplasia. But um, somehow we want to know that any criteria for predict the high grade dysplasia or cancer because it was more aggressive than just a linear play, um, low grade dysplasia. There was a retrospective, retrospective study in Japan with um, uh, 62 patients and two of those were fat uh, in 70 lesions. They found that the factor associated with the high grade this place here was the diameter of the lesion more than one centimeter, the reddish color or heterogeneous or no nodularity. Or importantly, if they, you can find a mixed or depressed macroscopic type, uh, it, you can predict this uh, the, the high grade dysplasia or cancer. They um, create the scoring system for predict um, the high grade dysplasia or cancer by validate this score in another group of the patient and found that if you can count the score more uh, three or more, the same spec accuracy and high for high grade dysplasia was uh, around 85 to around 80 to 90 percent. There was another study that recently published published this year about the uh, criteria for uh, predict the high grade of cancer. There was a um, prospective cohort study in Japan as well uh, in non-fat patients. And the factor that can predict high grade dysplasia was the size more than one centimeter and the non-opaque substance uh, findings. You can see the lesions here. If you can find only um, the opaque substance, the white opaque substance, less than 50% and the uh, loop is at least an open loop. If you can compare to the right side, this one is a closed loop without white opaque substance. On the left hand side, the white opaque substance, if you can find this one, it's quite, it's quite not serious because it's just only adenoma uh, or low grade dysplasia. And, but if you find the lesion like on the right hand side with the closed loop without white opaque substance, you have to be carefully look at entire the lesion and find any abnormal vascularity that can represent the high grade dysplasia or cancer. So I would like to give the take home message uh, of my talk about uh, the uh, uh, diagnosis of the small bowel uh, neoplasia, especially the adrenal neoplasia. If you know the underlying disease of the patient with FAP, you have to um, be um, concentrate with the, the lesions and tie of the small bowel. But if this patient just only sporadic case, no underlying with the FAP, uh, no need to explore other polyps in the small bowel. With FAP patient, this group of the patient were, were, are the, had the higher risk of the adrenal neoplasia. The factor that can predict the neoplasia was the size more than one centimeter or pathology with high grade or tubular villus adenoma. I recommend to, to do biopsy in all suspected lesion in fat patient, but for the sporadic case, the high risk patients depending on three factors. The location of the lesion, if it's proximal to the ampulla, 
is this patient has a high risk for the um, adenomatous chain and the size more than one centimeter as well as the non-white opaque substance or redness. These are the factors that can predict the high-grade dyspatia or um, cancer. Thank you for your attention. And I think we can um, answer the question later on after last talk. Is this better? Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Rapat, for that uh, very nice talk. So uh, we will now proceed with uh, uh, the next talk by uh, Professor Raj Singh. And uh, for everybody who's, uh, who's joining us tonight, uh, to today, uh, you can type your questions at the Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A button there at the bottom on the right side. But don't go too much to the right because you're going to press the leave. Don't leave us tonight yet. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, Raj, and then then we'll entertain the questions afterwards. Um, thanks, thanks, Jonat. Um, I'll try to share my uh, slides um, and hope you can you can see. Can you see my slides now? Yes. It's good. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jonat, and thank you uh, to the Anvic Group for um, this invitation. And uh, thank you to uh, Rapat for that very nice talk, uh, which was presented just now. It made things very, very clear. So what I'm going to do today is to discuss on endoscopic treatment of non-ampullary duodenal lesions. And uh, we can uh, take questions uh, towards the end. Um, so we'll get started. So uh, the outline will uh, focus on two things, the adenomas and how to remove them endoscopically, whether by the EMR or the ESD technique. And then we'll touch briefly on uh, neuroendocrine tumors uh, as well, uh, using the EMR or the uh, FDR full thickness resection techniques. So I think one of the most important things we have to realize is that duodenal adenomas are mostly detected incidentally. Um, we have uh, normally uh, a suspicion that it looks like a duodenal adenoma. Only once we reach the duodenum, most patients do not present with any symptoms, as we all know. And, you know, I would also say that most lesions are slowly growing. They're usually benign. And sometimes there is a question we have to ask ourselves, is it necessary to do anything at all? Um, there have been cases uh, where uh, a scope is put down, and this is an elderly person with multiple comorbidities, and you find uh, a duodenal adenoma. And the question which you have to ask yourself is, is it necessary to, to do anything? The risk of malignant transformation has to be weighed with the complications associated with therapy. And you have to be very clear with this. Because um, if you try to think back on all the many endoscopies which you have done, um, if you ask yourself how many duodenal carcinomas have you um, found, uh, I would say that you know it will be very few and far between. So I'm not talking about pancreatic cancers, just a straightforward primary duodenal carcinomas, and it's generally very very rare. Of course. Uh, in the past, there have been many iterations with regards to surgical interventions, including transduodenal surgical ampullectomies, Whipple surgery, which we all know is associated with a lot of morbidity and mortality. And some of the clever surgeons have used uh, different strategies, including a pancreas uh, preserving duodenectomy, where they can do a partial resection of a duodenal lesion, sparing the pancreas. But this is all associated with quite a bit of morbidity, up to 40%, and mortality up to 6% in some centers. Now, when we think about endoscopic therapy, we have to look at a few different things, including the uh, Paris classification, which uh, Rafa has very nicely put forth. And it's similar throughout the GI tract. If there are lesions which are depressed, then you worry if there's uh, more than just a straightforward adenoma, whether this is actually a carcinoma you're dealing with. And if you go on and perform endoscopic resection, 
it can lead to issues. So you have to be careful with that. You also have to look at the extent across folds because uh, sometimes, and I will show you shortly, that biopsies itself can interfere with the resection and you have to be careful with that. And then the ampulla, and we've got a case coming later on where you can probably see if uh, there's any ampullary involvement, but it is important to know if the ampulla is involved because your therapy and your strategy then changes. Don't underestimate resections in the dodenum. We may think that it's similar to a simple polypectomy in the colon, but things are more difficult with endoscopic resection in the dodenum. You can have a lot of uh, different uh, sort of issues happening there, including a thinner wall of the duodenum, uh, increase in bleeding, which I will uh, show you, um, as well as uh, sometimes the possibility of uh, uh, the margins being less distinct. As you start progressing, the margins actually become less distinct and it's very difficult to differentiate villi versus a duodenal adenoma. And these are things which you have to take into consideration. But what do we do first? Of course, uh, we can biopsy uh, to confirm that this is an adenoma. Uh, if we are worried, especially if lesions are more than one centimeter in size, what we could do is to orient the forceps parallel to the folds and do not sort of uh, take biopsies between uh, uh, on the fold, but take between folds, you know, because this is what happens. This was done yesterday. Uh, this is the lesion which I saw yesterday. You can see folds sort of converging and the polyp is stuck right up uh, on, on the lesion itself, which then makes it quite tricky to uh, resect this uh, because uh, once you inject, you may get a lift in certain parts of normal mucosa, but not, not the polyp itself. And then when you start resecting, you find there's a lot of fibrosis and bleeding can occur. Um, of course, you can deal with that, uh, and that's just a small lesion. Um, we also have to try to evaluate with a side viewing scope, a duodenal scope, if necessary, if there's a suspicion that there's the ampulla which is involved. And again, um, sometimes if you use a cap at the edge of the uh, scope with a forward viewing gastroscope, it may help you to push away the, mu uh, the, the mucosa for you to visualize the lesion well. Okay, but sometimes it's also necessary to be well versed with a side viewing scope uh, to visualize the ampulla. EUS may be helpful, but the role is quite unclear. Um, it can help us discern if there's a duodenal wall malignancy or invasion. Rapat has nicely shown you that there are also certain features, especially if a lesion is beyond a centimeter in size, if it's got a depressed component, and perhaps a reddish-like discoloration, which can veer you towards thinking that there could be more than just a straightforward adenoma occurring. Of course, with the ampulla, uh, CBD extension uh, of lesions uh, can be helpful if you use an EUS and MRCP, but uh, the main intent of this talk, again, is to look at non-ampullary duodenal lesions. Now, uh, we also have... Uh, uh, this, this predictors of malignancy and Rapat has nicely uh, informed you about ulceration and depression, redness, sometimes friability and bleeding can lead you towards more uh, or veering towards more duodenal carcinoma. And if the lesion looks firm and the distensibility, so if you inflate the duodenum and you find that the folds actually are making some sort of funny configuration rather than circular configuration, then you can sort of apply some of the principles of lesions in the stomach, the distensibility sign, which have been promoted by the Japanese, and try to extrapolate this to duodenal lesions. Okay, so some earlier studies show that it is actually pretty good. You know, we can achieve good complete resection, sometimes up to 100% of lesions, but this is important. Your first go is the best go when you look at the index procedure and you're attempting to resect this similar to lesions anywhere else, you have to give it your best shot because if not, you'll be um, uh, dealing with recurrences. Bleeding rates are much, much higher compared to the colon. And you have to be aware that intra-procedure bleeding all occurs almost every time. 
and post or delayed uh, bleeding can occur as the lesions get larger. And perforation rates uh, can vary between 1% to 3%. And as I said, recurrence is common uh, if uh, your index procedure is done, but is done not very well. Sometimes larger lesions and villous histology can recur, can lead to more recurrence. Uh, as I said, use the cap uh, if you can. You can use a variety of scopes. That's important, the duodenal scope, uh, the pediatric colonoscope can also help depending on the orientation. And sometimes you have to move and change your scopes to, uh, uh, to sort of approach these lesions because the configuration can also change. As you're there longer, there's more CO2 or air pumped in, and sometimes a lesion which is at the nine o'clock position can suddenly become the, the six o'clock position and then move on to the three o'clock position. So that can vary as well, depending on the amount of air or CO2 you use. Of course, you should use CO2 for this sort of uh, resections. Um, it is safer and um, you can deal with things if there's a complication. I try to use buscopan or glucagon. Um, this is just looking at uh, something called a flat villi sign. And I know that uh, Rappar has shown you some of the iterations with regards to uh, how you uh, differentiate polyp tissue from the dod from duodenal wall. It's quite tricky actually because they both look like villi, right? They both look like villi. So you can see in this example here, which we, we had uh, in video GIE a couple of years ago, uh, you know, what tells you that that is will I and uh, or, or not will I? So we, we use a little bit of uh, an underwater technique here. Yeah. And what, what's quite clear, uh, and this video will show, is that uh, the adenomatous component has got a clear demarcation line. That's one. And the other thing is that the will I surrounding the adenoma start, starts floating and moving around. Um, and and uh, what what you may be able to see a little bit later is that the adenoma does not. Okay, so we can uh, sort of uh, try to uh, demonstrate that you can actually see the villi uh, sort of moving, but but the adenoma does not, uh, or the adenoma sort of does does not um, um, uh, move much, but the villi sort of moves as as you can see there. In the in the corner at the seven o'clock position, as uh, water is being flushed, so so that is one one sign which can help us uh, help you uh, when you sort of try to reset lesions. I try to play this again so you can see that the villi is moving on the left hand side, but the adenoma which is in the center is not moving. Okay, so. Um, you can, you should use methylene blue or indigo carmine as the submucosal injected. And of course, a bit of adrenaline will help, mainly because this uh, will uh, reduce the intra-procedural bleeding rates and help you with the resection. Because once you see a lot of blood in the way, you can make your margins quite difficult to discern, especially if you're doing a piecemeal resection. You should use stiffer snares. Do not use a 25 millimeter or 20 millimeter snare because you're going to ca invariably capture a bit of the muscle. All right. And you have to be uh, very careful that you don't uh, sort of uh, use, use larger snares. So smaller snares are better. And again, as I said, complete resection is best at the index procedure. Okay. It gives you the best outcome uh, and reduces recurrence rates. This is a, a technique which we've been using quite frequently these days for smaller lesions. This is a lesion which is extending across a few folds, three folds to be exact, and probably measuring about 25 millimeters, but it's got a Paris type 2A sort of flat component. There's no nodula component, there's no depressed component. And uh, the findings on NBI is very typical of a tubular villus adenoma. Uh, which we then uh, go on and inject and uh, carefully resect in a piecemeal fashion using the cold snare method. Bit of oozing is seen that is not really of any consequence. And this sort of uh, thing uh, uh, approach may lead to less post-procedural or delayed bleeding, which can be an issue with these lesions because of the risk of the very high vascularity around this area. This is uh, another uh, lesion which as you can see, has been biopsied 
on the fold itself and it makes it really tricky. Uh, this was just done yesterday. It's not very large. It's about 10, 15 uh, millimeters perhaps, but extending across two folds. And that can sometimes be an issue. This, this video is not edited um, uh, because we ran out of time a little bit, but you can see it's a typical uh, T TVA. Uh, that's just using a bit of uh, something called TX, uh, TXI mode, which is the new Olympus platform. Um, and you can see the uh, scar right in the center there. Um, so this was carefully uh, sort of injected uh, like that. Uh, so you don't inject the whole thing. It's a sequential injection, all right? So inject and resect. And we, we're going to use a, a cold snare method here. And um, I'll just move this forward. A snare, a thin wire snare is being used carefully, judiciously, and we are sort of approaching the, 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 the more distal part of the lesion. First snare is moved into the channel, bit of suction to take the polyp into the uh, channel, uh, which will occur shortly. And what I tend to use here is a bit of uh, um, saline in my uh, foot pump and a bit of blue dye in it as well. And that allows a lift to occur like that. Okay, so it's it's not very uh, uh, tricky to do. Uh, as you would see that, that we started probably about 11 or five, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, and, and just carefully inject and resect um, the area. Um, and firstly tackling it uh, by the sides and then slowly moving uh, towards the center. So inject and resect. Again, as I said, I have not edited this video um, a lot, and you can see how it's moving and slowly sort of uh, creating the lift and trying to get to the central area, which, which was uh, the issue, which was uh, kind of pinned down. So we slowly do that as we move. Uh, this is just using uh, uh, an RDI sort of uh, method to look at the bleeding in, in the base. Um, it's just, again, a new platform, but you can actually see that, uh, what is it, 1120? Um, and uh, we, we have basically more or less uh, uh, done a bit of oozing there, which was not much of an issue, and which was uh, easily uh, sort of dealt with by leaving it alone, because we had to uh, um, sort of move on. So you can see that the resection is complete, 1122, 12 minutes. And, and then uh, there was this uh, other lesion, which I showed you as an image earlier on, uh, where we then just also cold snared it and uh, carefully cut it off. Of course, there's a lot of scarring and that could lead to uh, bleeding as well as we observe here, but that was not, not an issue and we easily dealt, dealt with it uh, without much of an issue. So this was done within 15 minutes. Uh, hot snare is the other thing. So when lesions become more bulky like that, uh, it's worthwhile to use a hot snare uh, technique because cold snare is obviously not going to get this. All right, so this is just, uh, again, uh, showing you the, the clear demarcation line, uh, the villi, which is on your left, versus uh, what Rafat has nicely explained as the pit-like pattern, which is on your right. Okay, so this is just showing you again how, how it works. Sometimes the cap uh, with a bit of uh, water, clear water without any infocol or, or any sort of turbid um, fluid can help you. You can see the polyp um, structure on the left versus the right very clearly. This is on white light, a little bit more or less distinct, but on a narrow band, it's actually much clearer. Okay, and that kind of is firm on the right but it moves on the left, all right? So that can tell you the demarcation area. So I'm using just a 10 millimeter snare here, and I'm slowly uh, getting the uh, lesion um, in a piecemeal fashion. So inject and resect, inject and resect. Obviously, uh, there's an issue with the dorinum, and you have to be careful because as, as the longer you are there, the more bleeding occurs, actually. Um, and that is possibly secondary to the rich vasculature, as I mentioned before. And if you're not happy with uh, the capture, you can release the snare slowly and then re-grasp and capture to try to remove uh, the lesion. So this whole lesion is slowly and carefully uh, removed. It measured about 
three three centimeters at least, or three point five. But we took it off in about maybe four pieces in a very careful manner. And uh, and if there's uh, bleeding which occurs like that, it's it's all right. You can use the tip of the snare using soft coagulation current and very carefully and judiciously trying to approach the base with soft coagulation current. And because of the risk of delayed bleeding, a lot of times uh, these sort of lesions, uh, we try to close them off with clips, uh, carefully taking the mucosa from one edge and uh, using the other edge to try to close it. So later studies have shown that intraprocedural bleeding is, is about 10%, but it's much higher for larger lesions. Uh, and post-procedural bleeding is a problem. Delayed uh, bleeding can occur up to 12%, but up to a quarter of uh, lesions more than three centimeters in size. Perforation and serositis of pancreatitis can occur. Stricture is an issue, especially if lesion ex the lesion extends beyond uh, one fourth to half of the circumference. All right, you're gonna deal with strictures sometimes up to 10%. And we're not quite sure how to deal with this, but the best thing is if your lesion has been resected totally and it's just a stricture, simple dilatation, serial dilatations can deal with this quite effectively. The problem lies when you've got recurrence and you've got a stricture, because it'd be very difficult to then resect whatever is there around the stricture or beyond the stricture. So that's why your first resection is the best uh, resection. You have to do it well. So we have looked at lesions which are larger than uh, two centimeters in size, what we sometimes deem as giant lesions. If they go three or four or five centimeters in size, and that can be sometimes an issue. And I'll just show you a, a video around this, uh, being mindful of, of time. But uh, this is a lesion which extends across uh, multiple folds and we're removing this in a piecemeal sort of fashion. As you can see, my snare is, is coming out from the uh, seven o'clock position. So this is a gastroscope which we are using. But um, at a certain point um, of time, we may start changing this to a colonoscope or pediatric colonoscope. So sequential resection, inject, and cut, inject and cut. Um, we're not gonna sort of uh, uh, inject the whole lesion because you don't want to do that. If you inject the whole lesion, you can have trouble. And you can see bile coming in and then oozing uh, uh, will start to occur once the pancreatic juice and the bile juice comes in the way um, as well. So sometimes that can be an issue. So uh, carefully sort of removing it. And uh, you know, this, this lesion is quite extensive and uh, we sort of carefully removing it in a, in a piecemeal sort of fashion. Um, you can see the submucosa there and you can see a little bit of oozing, but uh, ultimately uh, the whole lesion is come off a bit of oozing, but sometimes, as I said, there can be delayed bleeding up to 25% um, of the time. So uh, we do use GA for all these giant lesions. And as I said, you start with one margin and you progress continuously across the lesion. Um, in cases of papillary involvement, the papilla is isolated for an end block resection and you want to retrieve that and send that in a separate pot. That's it, intraprocedural bleeding, as you've seen, can be controlled with the snare tip soft coagulation method using 80 watts of carbon in effect four. Um, delayed bleeding in these giant lesions can occur in quite a lot of these patients and they generally are admitted, uh, not overnight, but sometimes up to two or three days to ensure they do not have uh, a bad bleed because this tends to occur normally in the middle of the night after you've had a long procedure. So these patients are put nail by mouth and IV fluids, and we routinely use IV octreotide to reduce the portal pressures so that we do not um, uh, encounter this sort of uh, massive bleed, which can occur generally in the middle of the night. So uh, uh, this is not based on any data or research or studies, but it's just based on re reducing the portal pressure with our experience with, uh, I guess, uh, varicial bleeds. Uh, lesions which 
uh, are deemed to have uh, stenosis can be reassessed, uh, especially if they're very large, in three to four weeks, and we can use a balloon dilatation regimen if necessary. And as I said, residual adenomas can be encountered as the lesion gets larger, there's a higher risk of recurrence occurring or residual adenoma, which was not resected uh, at the index procedure, but this can be resected using this snare resection very carefully. Once we've got a stricture though, this becomes very, very tricky. So we may say, forget piecemeal EMR, let's just do uh, ESD. There's data around this, interestingly, mostly coming from East Asia, meta-analysis of seven studies, and you can see the numbers are not large, just 203 lesions, very good end block resection rates, but you know, 4% went on to have surgery, 2% 2, 2 had bleeding, but uh, this is what is concerning, up to 15% had intraoperative perforations, fairly high, and 2% delayed perforation. So almost but seven, 17% of patients had perforation. So, you know, I'd be very worried. Uh, this mostly, this data mostly came from Japan. And I think, uh, you know, you have to be really, really fluent with ESDs before you decide decide to embark on these lesions. And, and so for now, ESD is not recommended in non-ampullary duodenal lesions. The issues around this, not only with uh, ESD, but EMR is that the submucosa is really tight, okay? It doesn't expand as what you would in the colon. Or, for instance, uh, in the esophagus, uh, you know, you can put up to 10 cc's of fluid and expand beautifully, especially when you're doing procedures such as POEM. But in the duodenum, it's very tight, especially in D1. It doesn't expand at all or expands very little. And the duodenum does not... Uh, um, move as freely uh, as, as the colon. So it's kind of fixed, it's like a fixed structure and that's difficult. And the MP layer is actually very thin. And after a while, as you saw in one of the videos, you get this pank and biliary juice coming into play and starting to digest a clot which you have created or digest uh, some of the, 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 the cautery which you have uh, uh, performed with a hot snare, and suddenly you find oozing occurring all over the place. This is just an example of a pretty bad experience we had with one of the lesions, a lot of bleeding in the base, uh, and ESD was performed, but you can actually see that um, uh, the bleeding was controlled. But as we sat there longer, you can actually see muscularis propria in the background here, the circular muscle, and that is concerning. Uh, an attempt was made to try to close this, but it was quite tricky. And the lesion, uh, uh, there was difficulty closing this lesion. And the patient did have a post-procedural abdominal pain and later on a contained perforation, which was managed conservatively. But this, these are the issues you can face with ESDs. Um, and, and, and that's why the recommendation is that if it is to be performed, the superficial submucosal layer should be attacked or, or resected or dissected rather than the deep submucosal layer because you don't want to see this muscle. Uh, it's very, very thin. Okay, so I'll, I'll touch on duodenal FDR as, as well. Uh, and uh, this is a, a study which was uh, published in the UAG journal. This is a video which we have created showing uh, you know, how it can be done. Uh, it is quite effective. Uh, the FDR has come into play using uh, what's called as the over the scope clip method. Um, and this is a lesion which is extending into a diverticulum. We can clearly see uh, the, the adenoma in there. And uh, what's being used is a um, marking device. And then after that, um, the lesion is pulled into the cap like that and uh, an FDR sort of uh, device uh, or clip is put forth. So, um, you, you can uh, get pretty good results, but uh, the um, data is still very sparse with regards to this. And of course, in the duodenum, you've got many other sort of organs around. 
So there's always a worry that you can sort of grasp more than what is necessary, especially you can imagine if the pancreas is sitting close by. So this is still a work in progress. For, for duodenal nets, there's not much, uh, there's in fact very little guidelines around, but we, we can use the band ligation technique for lesions which are less than a centimeter. Any lesion which is more than a centimeter in the duodenum, you worry that it is more aggressive and you don't want to go and perform an endoscopic resection unless you carefully think about it and think it is feasible. But lesions less than a centimeter, you can use the band ligation technique, but maybe, maybe, um, decide to cut above rather than below the band uh, because as I said, the muscle is quite thin. Okay, but the problem with that sort of strategy is that you may not get a clear margin because these nets, they arise from the submucosa and sometimes they are very close to the muscle. So you may not get a clear margin on your histological uh, specimen and that's when you may want to consider an FTR. All right, this is just another example of a net and you can see that it's not full thickness. We still got a bit of circular muscle at the end of uh, this uh, resection. So, uh, some, uh, so what do we do after the resection? Again, there's no clear guidelines to suggest uh, what can be done, but perhaps a gastroscopy uh, within six months for very large lesions and biopsy the scar site or treat the residual adenoma if you do see one. And thereafter, maybe another surveillance in a year, perhaps. Again, not very clear, no clear data around that. Uh, I just put there, and then what? Uh, again, no clear data, but perhaps three or five years after that, if you think, or if, you, if the biopsies do not show any uh, residual adenoma remaining. Okay, uh, last uh, slide, and then we will go on to uh, celiac disease quickly. There are some unanswered questions. What is the natural history of these polyps? As I said, most of them are found incidentally. And the question is, do you need to do anything about it? And I would say that if the patient is 80 years old, probably not. Do we use the coal or the hot snare? And this is again a contention. There's not much data on the coal snare. So maybe some of you want to do some research around this. Um, it is of course safer. And I would say that for flat lesions, perhaps that is the way to go. Flat, smaller lesions. Uh, do we place clips? Uh, yes, in duodenal EMRs, because of the risk of delayed bleeding, maybe we should just close the de defects, but you don't want to place the clip in the defect, okay? Because the wall is already thinned out. Now, if you place the clip and you capture some muscle uh, through it, uh, the clips could be sharp and they could lead to a defect within the muscle itself. Um, do we then uh, do a nice resection? The base is nice and blue with submucosa. Do we use uh, perhaps some added um, 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 strategies like a hemospray or purestat to cover the lesion so, uh, or the base so that it doesn't bleed? Maybe. Um, there's I think some data on Purestat, which has come from the Portsmouth group, uh, which we can look at. And then there's soft coagulation, bleeding, oozing occurring. We use the snare tip. Um, is there a risk that the perforation could occur as well? And you have to be very cautious and be judicious when you use that strategy. And uh, again, there's multifocal diffuse oozing sometimes as we are progressing with the EMR. Would we want to treat that? Maybe if it doesn't get in the way, we should not just leave it alone until we can complete the resection. So that could be a strategy. And, and occasionally you find this non-bleeding visible vessel, especially in the colon, but in the duodenum, you can find them as well. Do you treat it? Do you leave it alone? I think if you're planning to close the defect at the end, leave it alone, complete the resection, and then close the defect. And whether there's a role for second look endoscopy, perhaps, especially for the very large lesions, you know, maybe you want to consider that. And again, the unanswered questions with surveillance intervals, which, uh, as I said, is quite arbitrary, maybe six months for large lesions, then one year, and then three to five years. So in summary, non-ampullary duodenal lesions can and perhaps should be treated 
uh, tackle endoscopically rather than surgically. If you can convincingly uh, uh, assess the lesion and know that there's no, or uh, convinced that there's no carcinoma occurring, larger duodenal adenomas have a higher risk of incomplete resection and adverse events, including uh, delayed bleeding, uh, which is the most likely adverse event. And perforation, of course, in the duodenum is a dreaded one because you've got all these juices there and it can lead to quite uh, difficult circumstances after that. Um, there's no guidelines which exist on the management of a duodenal nets, but endoscopic resection appears appropriate for smaller net lesions. Um, so I'll thank you with that and uh, uh, move on. Um, to the uh, the celiac sort of disease, um, and then uh, Jonathan will take over with regards to Q and A uh, and um, a case presentation. So this is quite interesting. It's only seen in uh, mostly uh, Caucasian population, but I do know that tropical sprue and whatnot is is also common in Asia. Uh, this couple of slides uh, is based on uh, two papers which we have published one now almost a decade ago on a villous morphology in uh, duodenal um, uh, lesions or in, in the duodenum. And the other is a couple of uh, papers, uh, one in, um, in JGH on patchy distribution of C-leg disease with NBI. So this is just a video showing uh, what normal villi looks like. And we all know about this, of course, you know, this is just using the dual focus uh, scopes, which we have, uh, and you can see normal villi there. Um, and uh, as, as, as the video progresses, uh, you can actually see that this is uh, partial to absent uh, villi, or partial villus atrophy to absent villi. Um, and that, that, that is in keeping with celiac disease. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite clearly seen that villi is absolutely absent on the seven o'clock position here. I mean, it's partially absent, totally absent here in the middle. Okay, um, this is a nice case of a patient with normal villi. Okay, and as the scope moves, there's a lot of movement there. As the scope moves, you actually see that um, the, the villa is uh, either flat or totally absent. Uh, it's a very nice example of uh, what occurs in a patient in, with celiac disease where you have patchy villus atrophy. So absent villa in one area and all, almost this worm-like structure in another area. Same patient, right? So you see the worm-like structure here, normal villa. And then, as I said, you know, uh, absent to um, partial villus atrophy in another area. So this is, this is what we call as a patchy, a patchy villus atrophy. So it's just patchy over there um, and absent um, over there. And um, as you can see, um, uh, nice villi on, on, on this side here. So this, is, uh, this can aid us in uh, making a diagnosis number one but more importantly also targeting our biopsies to confirm if the patient has celiac disease because a gluten-free diet makes a hell of a lot of difference for these patients and they do have a lot of improvement in their symptoms once they go on a gluten-free diet or a diet without um, um, wheat-based products basically. So Thanks again. I will stop sharing and uh, I will hand this back to uh, Jonah uh, and Rafat to uh, carry on with uh, the uh, next session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Raj, for that uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, lecture on uh, the Dudinal uh, interventions. So I think uh, I would like to ask everybody to keep on the to keep the questions coming. And uh, yeah, just type on the Q and A uh, portion on the lower right side of the screen. Okay, so I think uh, there are some questions there, but uh, uh, there are some questions already on board. So I think we'll we'll proceed with the uh, with the case discussion. 
and because uh, I have a case recently that I uh, that I encountered in the unit, and uh, uh, perfectly it fit for this uh, for this conference of ours. So I guess uh, if I would want to share, and then we will incorporate all the questions into the case discussion as well. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Sorry. Okay. So uh, we have here a 53-year-old male who is hypertensive diabetic who just came in for an epigastric pain. So uh, the patient had some bloatedness, uh, non-radiating, and uh, it was not relieved by omeprazole. So ultrasound was unremarkable. So uh, physical examination was unremarkable. Patient had intentional weight loss due to dieting in this uh, lockdown that we have here. And uh, we did an endoscopy, and this was seen. Okay, so we, we could see the, uh, the, the ampulla there. Uh, clearly that it's uh, it's normal looking and then and then proximal to the ampulla that's uh, that's superior uh, oral side to the ampulla uh, we could see this this lesion so we did an NBI and and a magnification endoscopy okay and this is the ampulla as well. So this is the video of the side viewing endoscopy. Okay, we could see again the ampulla there, and we could see the lesion closely, uh, closely related to the ampullary area. Okay, and then uh, with further investigation and interrogation. Um, you could see this 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 should be quite a, a bumpy lesion that, that we're going to have to deal with in the next okay so that's the narrow band imaging so I think I would start with uh, Rapat uh, Rapat, if we, if we send you this kind of a lesion, uh, what are your thoughts seeing this? Thank you, Jonat, for the excellent and interesting case. As you see that this lesion is a large lesion. I cannot identify entire of the lesion right now because I think it's very big and it didn't involve the ampulla, right? Yes, yes, it didn't involve, involve okay. the ampulla. And you said that this is uh, located at the proximal to the ampulla. Yeah. And for the NBI finding, you can see mix of the, the pattern, groove and pit um, type of the epithelium. We cannot see clearly what type of the, the vascular pattern, but you obviously see the white opaque substance which is may not um, serious. It may be just adenoma, but you have to be carefully look at the non-white opaque substance area. And obviously, we can find the depressed area as well in this lesion. So I think this lesion can be, because it's a big lesion and com, um, combined with the various type of the micro... Um, a macro, um, fi macro endoscopic finding with included, which including the, uh, the depressed um, type of the uh, epithelium. So I think this may be uh, had uh, high grade dysplasia inside this lesion, especially at the depressed lesion. I think we should do endoscopic resection without any biopsy at this lesion. What about Raj? <laughs> yeah, um, very nice case, uh, um, I, it is, uh, I agree totally, Rapat. So um, in a sense, uh, 
there, there is possibly some ampullary involvement, though it's quite difficult to say with these images. Um, and based on the size, this extends across a few folds. Um, the morphology is in keeping most likely with a Paris type 1S type of morphology and a mix of 2A. And based on um, uh, this, this criteria of the pine cone appearance, this, this would be in keeping with, with most likely a, a tubular villus adenoma with either low or high grade dysplasia. Now, the converse uh, of uh, not doing anything for this patient uh, or to perhaps uh, advise uh, any other interventional modality is a cervical surgery because this is sitting next door to the pancreas. So the only, I think, less invasive uh, modality would be an endoscopic resection. And in this case, uh, if that is to be done, a uh, combination of um, a side viewing scope, a gastroscope, and, and perhaps even a pediatric colonoscope will help carefully starting from one edge um, and then uh, not injecting the whole lesion, but injecting until about maybe 12 to 13 millimeters of a lift and sequentially then um, uh, removing one area and then starting and carrying on to another area. And perhaps leaving the ampullary area uh, at the end um, to see if you need to take that off as well. Because it, it, it's quite difficult to discern the, the borders. Uh, and maybe if you use a cap, and this is a transparent cap uh, with the forward viewing scope, you may be able to tease out uh, the ampulla. And if there is, uh, uh, if there is uh, a discontinuity between the, the ampulla and the lesion, um, that is actually a good sign that you don't need to do anything for the ampulla and you can carefully then resect the lesion um, there. So if there's no continuity between the ampulla and the lesion, I would suggest you start at that area first and then carefully move around. But if there is uh, continuity between the ampulla and the lesion, and take all of the lesion out first and then leave the ampulla at the end, and once an ampulectomy is done, it's quite essential to then stent the pancreatic duct to prevent uh, post-procedural pancreatitis. Uh, while all of this is occurring, um, it is important that uh, bleeding will certainly occur as well. So you have to be mindful of that. Um, and delayed bleeding is possibly going to occur in... Uh, in this patient, the risk again, as I said, is about 37% to be exact. So there's a high chance that delayed bleeding could occur in this patient. And I would put the patient on uh, an octeotide infusion at least for 48 to 72 hours, in addition to a PPI infusion. And if possible, even dealing with the base, if everything is clear, um, with maybe some of the locally available uh, hemostatic um, um, uh, compounds, either hemospray or uh, purestat. So that will be uh, my approach. The other thing is once you take out these lesions uh, in a piecemeal fashion, uh, the polyp tends to sometimes fly off in the distance. Occasionally, it may sit in the duodenal cap, in the first part of the duodenum. So it's important to retrieve all of those uh, specimens. And sometimes some, some of us move into the stomach and just leave it there as we carry on resecting. And then at the end, of course, take the whole, uh, all of the tissue and retrieve it to send it for histopathology. Okay. Um, Raj, there's a question here that, uh, what's the role of endoscopic ultrasound in this lesion? So EUS, again, not very clearly defined. If there's some worry that there's a deeper infiltration uh, into the, um, uh, the deeper layers of the duodenal wall, then you would probably stay away from performing um, any sort of endoscopic resection. 
So uh, there is some role there with regards to the depth of infiltration, but clearly understanding that sometimes it's quite difficult to discern the wall um, um, or, or how deep the lesion is going. The other thing is it, it may be helpful with looking at whether the ampulla is involved as well. But again, this is operator dependent and depends on expertise available. Um, uh, Rapat, um, this is uh, this lesion is found superior to the uh, uh, superior to the ampulla. So I'm a bit worried that this uh, uh, this lesion might involve the minor papilla. So uh, how would you how would you approach it? Um, I think if you can find um, the minor papilla, not uh, besides the lesion, it will be good for you to 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 know that this is not involved the, the papilla. But um, I'm not sure that the the location of the lesion was uh, at the the median side of the duodenum, right? Yes, yes. Just above the, uh, if you could Just see above. the, you could see the still pictures. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this one, the, uh, the, 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 the ampulla, you could see a normal fold here, and the lesion is above. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Can you see my arrow? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see. This, this is the start of the lesion, actually. It's superior okay. to the uh, ampulla. Okay. So would uh, would an MRI help us out? Maybe MRCP, right? If you want to know that um, the organ involvement of, of uh, any involvement of this lesion by the external and hepatobiliary system, MRCP can help to to identify the the minor papilla to avoid um, pancreatitis after resection. Because it's quite large and um, it's quite difficult if you cannot identify from endoscopically, you may need other modality to help you to to identify. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a there's a question from Dr. Powar. Uh, do you guys, uh, well, Raj and Rapat, do you use uh, do you routinely use anti foaming agents in character when you? try to characterize For me, um, in the duodenum? Um, yeah, in, maybe in the duodenum or anywhere? Uh, in the upper GI tract, um, in my institute, we have to to um, NPO patients uh, around two hours before endoscopy. So um, we don't have any protocol to, um, to give the patient uh, taking any antifoamy substand before endoscopy but um, when you when I find any bubble I will use the cymeticone plus the water injection uh, and apply at that lesion and I think it's helpful because um, I can use the IEE to characterize the lesion with this um, uh, manual yeah uh, yeah so the um the importance of uh, anti-foaming agent is there for uh, detecting lesions. So, for instance, if uh, there's a lot of bubbles, so the anti-foaming agent will get rid of the bubbles. So, in order for you to visualize the overall area. Okay, so if possible, it's good to give patients an anti-foaming agent like a little drink. 15 to 30 minutes prior to the procedure. Now, that will help to get rid of the bubbles. But once a lesion is found, for instance, in your image here, then there is, if you use anti-foaming agent on this lesion, which you can clearly see, it will become a little bit murky, all right? So there'll be a whitish type murkiness to it which will make characterization a little bit more difficult. So I would recommend for characterization, meaning you're gonna study the lesion further now, you should not be using an anti-foaming agent at that point because you'll get this whitish film on the lesion. 
which will make interpretation of the um, mucosal and vascularity microstructure a bit more difficult. So use it, but use it 15 to 30 minutes before. And the idea of using it again is to get rid of bubbles. Uh, then the other thing, Raj, about uh, uh, about what you call this, uh, the the other thing about diagnostics is that uh, you presented a very good study on the the patchy villi in the uh, celiac uh, celiac disease. Uh, there was a there's a question here whether would water immersion technique be a better uh, better option, or did you do a study on that? Yeah, yeah, our study was on water immersion um, using NBI um, and uh, some level of magnification. That allows us to look at the villi, whether it floats or whether it remains uh, stationary or whether it is uh, sort of atrophic and um, completely flat. So that, that can assist us. And it is quite a useful tool to use uh, for patients who may present for an endoscopy and have, for instance, unexplained iron deficiency anemia or chronic diarrhea where you want to rule out some form of uh, villous um, pathology occurring or absorption, uh, an issue with absorption. So it can help with case finding, uh, which we, we have done some work on and it allowed us out of 110 patients, if I'm not mistaken, we did find six patients with celiac disease using that strategy. So yes, it can allow you to do that um, if you want to use water immersion. But just be mindful, you can uh, put quite a bit of water there sometimes. And if the patient is heavily sedated, some of this may reflux back into the stomach. And then if there's a cough bout, then that's going to go somewhere else. And that can be hazard, uh, a bit tricky. Uh, and the uh, follow-up to that would be, is it is it about time to replace biopsy as, uh, as the standard for diagnosing celiac disease? For now, uh, random biopsies is recommended, at least an, at a minimum four from the D2 and two from the duodenal uh, cap or D1. Um, the issue with this level of magnification is that we are able to call villus atrophy and um, flat villi versus normal villi, but we cannot look at two other criteria which is sometimes necessary for milder forms of celiac disease, which is crypt hyperplasia and raise or uh, uh, rising or uh, raise in the intraepithelial lymphocytes. Those are both microscopic type diagnosis which we cannot achieve with narrow band imaging and the magnification levels which we have. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for that, Raj. And then um, there was this one question that wants uh, some clarification on the uh, how to differentiate the uh, polyps, whether malignant, benign, or neuroendocrine? Any uh, any any uh, endoscopic uh, criteria that we follow, Rapat? Maybe. Um, I think right now we don't have any um, um, standard criteria for differentiate between high grade, low grade dysplasia, uh, but there are some study that I, I talked about uh, previously about uh, the criteria that may represent the high-grade dysplasia. For example, the non-white opaque substance or redness of the lesion or um, the location of the lesion located proximal to the ampulla and the size uh, larger than one centimeter. Um, and the, more importantly, the um, the micros macroscopic finding of the combination uh, uh, of the um, um, like a depression one two a or and two c uh, can 
represent the, the more invasive um, adeno carcinoma. So I, I don't think there was standard. They don't have any. We, we don't have any standard criteria, but we can apply this criteria for predict uh, the lesion of um, pathology from real-time diagnosis. So, uh, okay. Uh, uh, so from the real-time diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's Jonah. That, that's uh, for for net lesions. One of the things uh, which we we can make out is the yellowish discoloration because these are sub-epithelial lesions and somehow uh, with normal white light endoscopy you'll find a vague yellowish discoloration um, underneath the lesion so that is one of the giveaways for for net compared to adenomas so, uh, so for this case uh Apart from uh, further investigation using a, an MRI and an EUS, uh, there's a question there here is that uh, how we're going to, uh, so are, do we recommend an ESD or an EMR? Uh, definitely not an ESD uh -huh. because it's, um, uh, unless, uh, suppose uh, you're very comfortable with uh, finding the, the, the layers, uh, I would not recommend an ESD. I think an EMR is a safe bet. And uh, since uh, I kind of missed your initial picture, which you showed very clearly that the ampulla was not involved on, on white light, I would start off with one area. Um, in fact, um, even the, the, the more uh, proxim proximal area and then slowly move towards the more distal area, taking your time. The patient needs to be also intubated for the procedure. Um, it's very important uh, because this is going to take some time. And it's quite likely that the defect will be quite large and it will be impossible to close the defect. Um, so uh, just be aware of the delayed bleeding risk and uh, take the necessary steps uh, to try to mitigate that. Maybe even a, a counter procedure would be to have a second look endoscopy 24 hours later to ensure that there's uh, everything is under control if the resection is successful. Okay. And uh, uh, the the follow-up question is when do you when do you use a fluoroscopy room if the uh, if for these kinds of cases? Into, in my uh, experience, if there's uh, ampullary involvement, then definitely you need to use a fluoroscopy room because you then have to firstly resect the ampulla and then you have to cannulate the pancreatic duct. You can't do that without fluoroscopy. So uh, that, that's where it, it, it comes into play. Um, if there's no ampullary involvement, then fluoroscopy is not necessary. Okay. And then, uh, and then the other thing is that for large or small defects, uh, do you routinely use clips to close it? Yeah, um, I think because the risk of uh, bleeding is is quite high. I would say, in my experience, anything beyond three centimeters almost always bleeds uh, at twelve midnight. Um, and then you have to come back. <laughs> so I would say, if possible, if possible, uh, use the clips to close because that is the most um, easiest way to to deal with this uh, lesions uh, or the defect of the lesion. Lesion. The the most difficult part is that sometimes the the duodenum, as I mentioned in, in my talk, is quite fixed, so it may be difficult to oppose. The mucosa from one area to the other. But if you use some of the larger clips which are available, uh, that could be possible. And the other thing is if you use a zipper close method where you start off from uh, one normal sort of edge to try to make both edges fold up into almost like a, like a, a, a V, upside down V pattern, 
you may be able to then slowly and carefully close from one edge to the other. Of course, in this sort of lesion which you're showing, Jonathan, I think it's going to be impossible. Um, and then you also worry that if you close the defect, you don't want to close off the ampulla. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so that that you have to be very cautious about. So, um, yeah, clips is an absolute necessity when you can uh, approach these uh, lesions unless you are cold snaring them. Uh, cold snaring small lesions, then I don't think so you need to uh, use the clip. You can wait for a bit until the oozing stops. A lot of times it just stops spontaneously and you don't need to do anything further then. So you don't really need to close those lesions. But uh, for lesions which you use hot or which you use current, you have to uh, ensure that maybe you should close them because the risk of delayed bleeding is, is there and it's higher than in the colon. Raj, can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Okay. Do you have any um, threshold for the cold snap polypectomy and clipping? Um, you, you said that the lesion more than three centimeters, you, you recommend using clipping, right? But if you use the cold snap, yep. the lesion so again, very larger or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... so um, so for the, the paucity of data with regards to delayed bleeding in cold snaring in, in the duodenum. In fact, cold snaring in the duodenal lesions itself, there's paucity of data. It's not a lot of data out there. Um, so I wouldn't, personally wouldn't uh, apply clips uh, for cold snaring. Okay. Yeah, I would not. Um, I would of course wait for a few minutes until I'm convinced that mm -hmm. the oozing is slowly sort of uh, reducing and, and it has stopped, I'll be happy with that. Um, but if there's a hot snare being used, then I would try to close the defect unless it's very large. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have a, a Raj or Rapat? Do you have any experience with? Uh, I I've seen some publications regarding uh, doing the the line or putting an end and closing it to to oppose the lesions uh, to oppose the defect. I have one experience about not in the loop, but um, over the scope clip always call to um prevent the delay perforation in the for the duodenal ESD for the uh, net. Um, I have to apply two clip at the lesion because it's quite big and I cannot use only one clip to to um, to close all of the defect. So I apply two clip there and it's work. Um, no um, delay perforation and patient can be discharged within three days after the, the procedure. But I never use the endo loop or others. Well, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you about that, Robert. Uh, well, one, one of the things about uh, perforation in this area is that it's going to create a huge abscess there at the retroperitoneal area. So when do we, when do we call the surgeons to come in? Or are, do you have any experience with combined endoscopic, laparoscopic uh, procedures? Um, so for me personally, no, no, no experience in the duodenum for combined laparoscopic, endoscopic procedure. I, I don't even know if that's 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 feasible, um, given the organs around. Um, but the main time where you get your surgeons involved is uh, if you have a suspicion that um, there is a deep deep muscular injury injury in the wall i think uh, the first instance to do when when that occurs is uh, firstly try your best to close the defect ensure that you are only using co2 um, and not the air button and the CO2 button is on together or the air button is on and the CO2 button is off. You have to be ensure that you've got CO2 there um, and try your best to close the defect if possible. Now, as I said, um, 
it's sometimes tricky because the defect is too large and occasionally um, the duodenum is quite fixed so the it's quite difficult to close the defect. But if there's a suspicion of deep muscular injury, I think it's worthwhile to get your surgeons on board um, so that they are aware. And if the patient shows any signs of peritonism, um, it's when the surgeons should probably get in there and try to help you close it. Thank you. So, um, uh, I think uh, I think we've gone through. I think we've gone through all the questions presented. If there's any other questions from the audience. Inco Carmine versus virtual chromo endoscopy. Any thoughts on that? Um, that I, I present in the slides. Um, chromo endoscopy just only improve the number of the duodenal adenoma detection, but cannot um, characterize any the the, the, the lesion. So uh, you can detect more, but mostly. The, there was a, there are the small one which cannot any um, effect in clinical practice. So I don't think chromo endoscopy can help for surveillance um, in those patients. Um, so um, I think um, the digital endoscopy, digital chromo endoscopy with magnification can help co to characterize the lesion. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yep. Yeah, there's no. No role for chromo in duodenal lesions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I think we have run through the questions that were presented by the audience, and uh, one, uh, any any parting words from our speakers? Mm -hmm. um, no, enjoy your weekend. <laughs> you too, Raj. Everybody, should. we're we're uh, we're confined to our homes. <laughs> okay, Joan. Uh, do you have anything more to? I think I think we've run through all the questions, and we have had uh, very good presentations by our uh, speakers. And then thank you, Raj. Uh, thank you, Rapat, for all of that. And uh, and I guess uh, yeah, we shall uh, call it a day. And uh, Joanne, do we do we have any resources that they can come back to if they if they need further uh, review of anything? Um, actually, um, all these videos will be uh, available later on our MBIC website. Yeah. Our, our our new website will be uh, reopened uh, end of this month, so they can uh, they can view uh, um, the the lectures again uh, at our website. Okay, so with that, I think uh, we'll call it a night. Uh, thank you everybody for attending, and uh, I hope uh, this this series will go on until December. So uh, take note of the the next uh, the episode number seven. Okay, so we are episode six. <laughs> okay, so episode seven will be coming. So the the secretariat will announce uh, uh, when the ne the next meeting would be, and uh, including all the links. Okay, everybody, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.